Good evening, everyone. This is Brian Vance. I'm the supervisor for Amer Missouri Shoreline Management Office. And tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about Lake of the Ozarks. We'll talk a little history, how the lake operates, some of the unique challenges of the lake, and just general information that all of us that live in central Missouri might find interesting about one of the largest man-made features in the state and probably the largest economic engine in central Missouri. Many of us know that the construction of Bagnell Dam began in 1929 when people gathered near the town of Bagnell to start a massive construction project. But many people don't know that the Lake of the Ozarks and Bagnell Dam was originally started all the way back in 1912 when a gentleman by the name of Ralph Street decided that it would be a great idea to harness the power of the Osage River and generate hydroelectricity for the new thing called electrification in the St. Louis area. Um, Mr. Street was the recipient of a license from the federal government to dam the waters of the United States and to provide the, for the construction of the dam. He was seeking funding and he sought funding from a gentleman by the name of Walter Cravens from the Kansas City Joint Stock Land Bank. And they began the endeavor in 1912 to uh, procure all of the land necessary to build the dam and to see if they could harness the power of this great river. Uh, they had many successes and many failures. Um, they acquired a lot of property. Uh, eventually, they were acquiring it by ill-gotten means. Mr. Cravens ended up in federal uh, penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas, and the project was put on the skids in Bagnell Dam and the Lake of the Ozarks almost didn't happen. However, Ralph Street, still his dream to see the Lake of the Ozarks created and to harness the power of the Osage River. And he finally sought funding from Union Electric or convinced Union Electric that there was viable means to make electricity. The Lake of the Ozarks and Bagnell Dam would be a good idea. Um, Union Electric had acquired a large contract to sell the power that could be produced in the lead belt in southeast Missouri. And so Union Electric finally acquired the license to build the facility from Ralph Street and convinced the federal government to turn it over to them. And the construction of Bagnell Dam began in 1929. And this slide is the original Osage Valley before construction started. You would be looking from the east side of the river, looking to the west, the hillside, and you see the barn on the right side of that slide. That's the city of Lake Ozark today. So in case you're ever wondering what the Osage River looked like before the dam started, this is the picture. Here the clearing has begun. Again, you're looking west towards the city of Lake Ozark. The interesting thing about all of these photos, these historic photos I'm gonna share with you tonight, they are available to you, the public, or anyone interested um, on the Secretary of State's website. The simplest way is just to do a quick Google search for historic Bangle Dam photos, and you can find that archive, usually on the first page of the search results. And all of the photos that you see in this presentation that are from the 1920s and 30s are available there. The collection was donated to the state and made a public record by Union Electric back in the 1980s. So if you want to have a few of these photos to frame or to display, and you'll see them all over town, they've become pretty popular through our community. They are available. You can download those from the internet today. So one of the things that was very interesting, if you can imagine, in 1929 is where are you going to provide a labor force or how are you going to acquire a labor force to build a giant concrete dam across the river? How are you going to feed them? How are you going to house them? So part of the construction was to build a mess hall. Um, it was one of the many ancillary buildings built to support the project. There was a time office, a hospital, um, housing for the key men, um, its own entire community developed right around the town of Lake Ozark 
and around Bagnell Dam. And obviously other towns in the area such as Elvin offered housing and supplies and equipment. So just the logistics of coming up with a way to feed and take care of the estimated 20,000 workers that participated in the construction of the dam it was no small undertaking in itself. Many of these buildings, uh, the, the laying of the railroad track from Bagnell, Missouri on up to the powerhouse itself at, at Bagnell Dam were all completed by Cravens and Street before Union Electric acquired the, the interest in, in building the dam and the lake and, and many of that or much of that construction was completed already and when Union Electric acquired the rights, they also acquired that infrastructure that had already been started. Here's a view of the camp hospital. This building is still in existence today. If you're on Union Electric Road between uh, the dam and you wind your way up the hill to where Amory, Missouri has our poles and wire yard, you can see this building on the right hand side of the road if you're traveling up the hill. It's a little white sided building with a small porch on the front of it. The camp hospital is uh, now part of the National Historic Registry. Uh, Ameren, Missouri maintains that as a clubhouse for community events and for workers within the company to reserve and have wedding receptions or birthday parties, etc. Since it is a national monument as far as being on the historic register, we are required by the federal government to keep and maintain that building and to try to preserve its unique character as a kind of a record of the construction process and of the completion of the dam and the lake. Here's the time office. Um, the interesting part about the time office is you had to check in and out to report your time every day as you went to work there. Some folks will know a gentleman by the name of Alan Sullivan, who, a pretty prominent member of the Ameren, Missouri family who worked at Bagnell Dam his entire career until he re retired just a few years ago. Alan tells the story of his uh, grandfather and uncle who slept in a barn on Duckhead and would have to make their way to the time office every day um, in order to check in and out of work. So it's about a two mile walk from Duckhead down to where the time office was and they did that every day and slept in a barn. So it's certainly totally different times than they are today with how the workforce came and went and just the arrangements and the willingness of people to have a job during what undoubtedly was the start of the Great Depression is kind of a unique testament to the men and women of the era of completing Bagnell Dam. The, the folks that built the dam were extremely resourceful. Here is a floating sidewalk that extended basically across the entire width of the lake today. It was put and placed in anticipation of the lake filling up. If you look in the upper right hand corner of the slide, you can see Wilmore Lodge. And so this would be over in the area of the first cove on the strip and they have taken these giant western cedar logs that were brought in, placed a couple tuba twelves across them, and when the lake filled up, they would have a floating sidewalk that you could walk from one side of the lake to the other. Quite ingenious. Um, many of those logs in this apparatus were later turned into a log boom that set out in front of the powerhouse that kept trash and debris from entering the, the turbine intakes. And some of these logs were still in the lake as late as 2010 um, when we took the remainder of them out. And the wood from the logs is just like it was cut down yesterday. So it's very resistant lumber that was brought in from the West Coast for this part of the project and still makes a neat story today to think that things were laying in the lake for 80 years and we took them out and the lumber is still good. Those giant trees we uh, that ones that we could salvage. We uh, actually had it come cut into dimensional lumber and we still give gifts for some of our volunteers that help out in keeping the lake clean from that. So kind of a cool way to preserve some of the history. The company store was also available. Um, thousands of men working on the project had to be clothed, 
had to have materials provided, shoes, boots, etc. If you're ever over at Wilmore Lodge, some of the original price sheets and paycheck stubs are over there. You can thumb your way through and you can find out what a pair of boots cost, how much a head of lettuce was, the other things that could be bought at the company store. And this side, we're now on the west side of the river looking back east. Um, you notice in the upper right hand corner is the water tower. That water tower is still in existence today. Um, you can see it up on the east side of the hill as you're driving across the dam. It was one of the other pieces of infrastructure that was necessary. They had to supply water to all of the buildings and the workers. If you look on the lower right hand side, you can see all of the trees and vegetation that was cut and removed. Um, if you are down below the dam today, you know, it's fully wooded and has restored itself, but you'll know that none of the trees in that area of the riparian corridor of the river are going to be any older than about 85 to 90 years old because literally every piece of vegetation that could be used was used and removed by the workers when they were building the, the powerhouse, the dam, and making all the other improvements to make it into a fully functioning hydroelectric facility. Still under construction here, um, looking back towards the town of Lake Ozark from the East Hill side. The takeaway from this uh, picture is it, it, it was cold. They worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, there were no down, there was no downtime, no starting or stopping for the project. It was in operation from the first shovel of dirt all the way till electricity began generated. Other items that were required to be built by Union Electric. Um, this is the old upside down bridge on the Grand Glaze arm of the lake. If you look on the right hand side of where the bridge is and you can see the roadway going up, that's old Highway 54. That would be in the area of Panera Bread and Andy's Frozen Custard today. This, um, this was a requirement by Union Electric to build this bridge, um, later turned over to the state of Missouri, and obviously the simple two-lane underspan bridge has been replaced with the big modern six-lane bridge that we have today. We're moving on into construction, still not quite even a, a year into the, the project. You can see we're July 31st of 1930. The interesting point of this photograph is the first portion of the project to be installed was the spillway or the, the floodgates as, as everyone likes to call them locally. So you see the concrete structure right about in the middle of the photograph. That's where the floodgates are today. And they built the coffer dam, which is the dam on the right hand side of the picture where you can see a little house looking um, device with a boom off of it. That's one of the many steam shovels there. So what they did was they installed this coffer dam on the right hand side of the screen to dam the river up and reroute it through the floodgates. And you can see that channel there kind of up in the middle portion of the, the photograph going to the spillway. So they had to cut the river off, reroute it through the spill gates, and then where you see what looks like a little pond in the middle and you have the floating derrick in there and the floating crane, that is where the powerhouse, that is where the electric units and the controls and all of the items that are gonna be used to make electricity are going to be installed. So the next photograph here we have in August is the conveyor to the concrete mixing plant. So all of the concrete was mixed on site. The, the dam itself is what's known as a concrete gravity dam, meaning the sheer weight of the structure itself holds it in place and keeps it from moving down the river. And all of the materials were locally sourced from the Osage River, except for the cement itself, the cement product, but the aggregate and the sand were all taken out of the river. And today you can still see some of the remnants of the train that brought the material up from Bagnall and some of these old conveyor structures. If you look on the 
west bank of the Osage River, you'll see a lot of the piling still in the river itself. A lot of the standing wood timber that you see out there when the river is low is the remnants from these structures. We're up to uh, September 29th, 1930. The powerhouse is under construction. You can see where we had a floating pond a little earlier with a, a steam derrick that was more like a boat in the middle. That's all gone. Now you're seeing the actual construction of the inner workings of where the turbines and the controls, the pinstocks and the draft tubes that take the water from what will be the lake to power the turbines and take it on down to the river. You can see that just in a month's time, quite a bit of construction activity has occurred. The building pace is very rapid. Here's the view of the, the spill gates. This kind of ties into a slide or two ago where the river has been rerouted. You can see they're pouring the, the sections of the spill gates in, in units. Um, those are each about 40 foot wide. And there are some of them that are open that the river is running through. And eventually those will all be sealed up so the lake can form behind it. Here's an upstream view of the, the powerhouse section. Um, this would be, you can barely see on the middle right hand side, some of that metal sheet piling. That's the coffer dam that was originally constructed. And now that they have the actual dam structure going up, you can see a bunch of large square window looking facilities. Those are the intakes for the turbines. That's where the water actually comes in from the lake. And those are down about 50 feet below normal lake level. Um, originally, the dam was designed to have a 30 foot swing in elevations. So if full pool was at 660 feet, they had planned on dropping the lake up to 30 feet in order to take advantage of all the water to make electricity. Obviously, that's not how the dam and the lake is operated today. We only have a six foot swing in our lake levels from about elevation 654 to elevation 660. Also important to point out in these, uh, the intake structures themselves, um, being 50 feet or so down below the surface of the lake, that can lead to some of the environmental challenges downstream in the Osage River that can occur that section of the lake in the summertime, many of you will know that we have stratification in the lake where we have an upper layer where we have a lot of oxygen. We have the thermocline and below we have the area of the lake where we don't have any oxygen. And in the summertime, we are pulling that water, this low and dissolved oxygen through the turbines and releasing it down to the Osage River and that can cause quite a bit of problems for the fish and the things that live in the river. If it's low in oxygen, they have a struggle in surviving. So over the years, Amherst, Missouri has invested lots of time and money and effort into raising the dissolved oxygen into the lower Osage River. Um, we have some of the most sophisticated controls in the country on how we entrain air into that water so we can release water down into the river that has enough dissolved oxygen not to limit or um, retard growth or survivability even of the fish and the other aquatic plants and animals down in the lower Osage River. That's one of the things that we're required to do by our water quality certification with the state of Missouri is to maintain at least five parts per million of dissolved oxygen in the in the river in our release water. So it's very challenging for us, um, something we've spent a lot of time and money in ensuring. And one of those things that we can report has been a huge success from the company and in enhancing the environment of the Osage River by making sure we meet our state required dissolved oxygen limits. 
Here's a view of the pin stocks and the draft tube. So the pipe coming out of the wall, sorry about that. The pipe coming out of the wall on the left side of the slide, that would be tied into that square window of the previous slide that I was mentioning. That's where the water's gonna come in. It's gonna come in that tube, spin around a scroll case. And these gentlemen that are working here are working on the, where the actual turbine itself is going to be installed. Here's a view of the powerhouse crane. You can see this if you go down below Bagnell Dam today, we still use it. Anytime you need to pull something out of one of those big giant turbines, here's, this is the generating rotor being lifted. The crane is rated for 150 tons. It's a quite large machine, um, working on a really large machine. Um, all of that was done and designed without computers and all of the crazy information that we have today, but the precision that was used and the quality and the skill is evident today and that we're still operating this facility in such a manner that it's still viable as an electric generating facility in the modern era. Here's the head gate sealing the lake from the pinstock. So basically behind this gentleman in that door, if the lake was full, he's down about 50, 60 feet underwater. And that head gate is what's keeping the water out of the powerhouse, out of the scroll case, and the generator, all of that area. And that's how you seal it off. And you can unwater everything and work on the units today, the same as this photograph would show. This is kind of looking at the other view. You're looking at the main unit scroll case and you can see kind of the vertical up and down slots over on the right hand side. That's Those are the wicket gates. That's where you um, can adjust the flow in and determine how much water you're releasing through, how much water is coming to the generators, and how how hard the unit will be running. Here are a couple of slides of the turbines themselves. The one on the left is an original to the construction of the dam. The one on the right is one from our upgrades in the late 2000s. Um, we changed out six of the eight generators, I'm sorry, of the turbines. So we still have two original turbines running. Um, the new models, one on the right, they're a hollow thin turbine. I mentioned the dissolved oxygen pro problem that can occur due to the stratification of the lake during the summertime. The hollow thin turbine blades were one of the upgrades we made to try to address that. As that unit spins, air is actually brought into the water column to help raise that dissolved oxygen. One of the downfalls in that, I wouldn't call it a downfall, one of the challenges that you have when you're entering and adding a bunch of oxygen to water is you can get your other total dissolved gases so high that that can also become a problem for the aquatic life downstream. So we have to be careful that we don't overdo with the total dissolved gases. I don't know if you've ever seen a fish with suffering from too much total dissolved gas, but they get what they call fish bubbles. Their skin and their eyes kind of have little blistery bubbles that, that occur. So we're all always checking that um, volume of dissolved oxygen and total dissolved gases. And literally we have a computer monitor that has a red line and a green line, and you're trying to make sure that all of the water coming out of the dam is between the red and the green line. You're just running at that state where you have enough oxygen, but not too much total dissolved oxygen. And the guys in the powerhouse, they've added a number of automatic controls that shut down or add in oxygen as necessary to keep those, uh, those parameters within the terms of our water quality certification from the state of Missouri. So here we are, not quite two years later, the lake is starting to fill. Um, 
and form the Lake of the Ozarks. It certainly looks a lot different today. Um, originally, only six turbine units were installed in 1954. We added the other two to where the eight turbines that we have today. So when you go down below Bagnell Dam, you see the big giant blue covers sitting there on the powerhouse deck. Those are the turbines. That's what makes the electricity. It's shipped up to the transformer bank and then sent down two transmission lines, one on the east side of the river and one on the west side of the river. The dam itself produces about 245 megawatts of power, enough power to provide energy to about 40,000 or 45,000 average size homes. Ameren, Missouri uses the facility today as what is known as a peaking and load following plant. So when you go to work in the morning and everyone wakes up and getting ready for their day, there's a real peak demand for electricity at that time. And that's when you'll generally see Bagnell Dam start making electricity is in that, those peak demand times. And the other times that it's used when the load following capacity is to help stabilize the electric grid and provide for some stability and in support of the other electric power plants that Ameren has onto the electric grid in, in the Missouri, central Missouri and St. Louis area. You can see uh, also in this photograph, a barge running off of the top with a crane on it. We believe that was the old barge that the Tom Sawyer, or I'm sorry, yeah, the Tom Sawyer sat on for many years. That barge was in the lake as of 2015 or 16 when it was finally removed. So a lot of value in those old structures and everybody used them well to the end of their life. So kind of the modern era photo of Bagnell Dam, one of the questions we often get is, well, how long can the dam last and how long will you, will it be there? Well, I thought I would just share a few slides of the stabilization project that we completed just a couple of years ago, 2017, 2018, where we looked at stabilizing the, the dam to make sure it could withstand what's known as a probable maximum flood. Um, it was a, de a design effort and a safety effort to ensure that if we ever had a major flood, something might occur at Truman Dam, some emergency that the dam would not be overtopped and washed away. So we, we began by hydroblasting and removing some of the surface concrete, installing 67 new anchors, adding 66 million pounds of concrete, adding new drains and overlays to extend the life of the dam. I'll show you the final product picture here in a minute, but if you go down below the, the dam today, it's quite obvious to see the new concrete versus the old, and you can really tell what, what we did there. It was about a $60 million job. It was a huge investment for Amherst, Missouri. Um, just kind of shows the importance of Bagnell Dam to Ameren, Missouri. You know, it still makes green energy with renewable hydroelectric power, and, and that's important in today's climate and the discussion of climate change. So here's the west retaining section before construction began. You notice the concrete is uh, has quite a bit of discoloration and cracking and we went in and basically took a giant power washer and broke up all of the loose concrete and got down to a very stable underlying concrete and then went in and placed a new cap of concrete over that. Then we drilled in anchors where we couldn't add extra weight to the dam. Those were drilled 100 feet into concrete or I'm sorry, into bedrock and then they were tensioned to that bedrock. So basically just imagine a big long piece of cable extending 100 feet. First off, drill all the way through the dam, then extend 100 feet into solid bedrock, then cement that all in place and then get a big giant hydraulic jack 
and pull that with a few million pounds of force and then cap that off. So it, it effectively increases the downward pressure of the dam onto the bedrock. Here's kind of a few shots of the cables themselves. You can see how long that cable is in the middle. So it has to be drilled a hole, drilled all the way through the dam into the bedrock and then they snake it down through the hole they just drilled. The picture on the left is the hydraulic ram putting the tension on that cable. And then the picture on the right is how it was left after it was cut off and secured. And you can see the remnants of where those cables were. Um, if you go down below the dam and look in the spillway section, you'll see a little bright, shiny piece of concrete that's in a circle form, and that's where the anchors were drilled in. In addition to the resurfacing, we added the 60, 6 million pounds of concrete weight by filling in underneath the roadway um, these big giant squares of concrete in between the, the columns there is the additional weight. And again, all of that was done to increase the, the sheer down pressure on the dam to make sure that if, should we get this probable maximum flood that we would survive and not be washed away. So here's a sec, here's a photograph of the completed project. You can see all of the mass concrete that was added there on the west section and then in the spillgate section, you can see those little white circles. That's where the concrete anchors were added. Those, all of these improvements were done in conjunction with the anchors that were installed in the 1980s through the roadway deck. Um, many, many of you that have been here for a while may recall in the 80s that Bagnell Dam was closed for a few weeks at a time while they installed those anchor, anchors. We believe those anchors are still good and valuable. However, there was no way to test that. So in, in our calculations for de determining if we could withstand the probable maximum flood, we had to assume that they weren't of any value and had to go with this other measure of adding the weight and the new cables. But, all, but we really do think those cables and anchors are still effective. So having said all that, we really feel like the dam is uh, quite secure and in good shape. We should be able to get, you know, another 100 years out of it as we're rapidly approaching the 100 year anniversary of, of the dam itself. Additionally, in 2020, we began replacing some of the computer controls and automation of some of the infrastructure inside the dam as well. So the, and the investment in the dam from Ammon Missouri standpoint is, is important. Obviously from the lake communities standpoint is vitally important since most of us live and work at the lake, somehow our business and our income is generated from, from the reservoir itself and not just the electricity that Ammon Missouri produces from the, the dam itself. And today, this is, uh, this is kind of what we all know the lake looks like. You can see this is one of the first years of the shootout before the old Hurricane Deck Bridge was gone. I know many of us would love to have that beautiful structure back in place. And unfortunately, it wasn't cost effective for the state to do that when they decided to replace it. But I think this is how most of us associate the Lake of the Ozarks today. It's the playground of the Midwest with lots and lots of boating traffic and lots of interest in the recreational value that it provides the community. So some important facts to think about. Um, we get a lot of calls in our office about why we don't keep the lake at XYZ level. Just pick your point, pick whatever elevation you want. How can we just can't maintain it flat all the time? Well, part of that is because we are involved in something that's much big, bigger much larger than the lake itself. So the watershed for the Lake of the Ozarks extends all the way back out into Kansas. Um, it's about 14,000 square miles of drainage area behind Bagnell Dam. Above Bagnell Dam, there's a number of other large reservoirs. Many of you are familiar with Truman Reservoir. And then we have Palmy, um, Stockton. There's three others out in the state of Kansas that are all part of a system trying to manage the water flow that falls within the watershed and 
that dictates how we operate the lake. Um, that large area can produce obviously a lot of runoff and a lot of water. Not only are we part of this watershed, or this is the watershed above Bagnell Dam, we are part of the watershed of the Missouri River further downstream. So what we do at the lake can impact others. All of that water management is closely coordinated between Ameren, Missouri and the Corps of Engineers. And we have operating guidelines that tell us how and when we're going to manipulate and move water level, how much water we're going to store, or how much water we're going to release. So that's an important point as a lake resident or someone in the lake area to note that it's not simply the water that's in the Lake of the Ozarks that dictates how it is operated and managed. It's a much larger animal than just the lake itself. Well, let's talk just a little bit about the lake facts. We are 93 miles long, 1150 miles of shoreline, about 55,000 acres, um, approximately 600 plus billion gallons of water, and the one fact that everyone always wants to know is how many docks are on the Lake of the Ozarks. Well, there are about 25,000 boat docks on the lake, and that number has been relatively stable over the last five or 10 years. As we get new docks in the coves, we seem to get fewer docks on the main channel. The main channel obviously is quite rough. And those docks seem to be going away, but others are being in place and where it's a little more quiet and calm. The lake is operated under our FERC license. Ameren, Missouri is issued a license to operate Bagnell Dam and in exchange for making the electricity out of Bagnell Dam, we are required to manage the reservoir itself and we do that under our shoreline management plan, our historic property plan, and our recreation plan. The shoreline management plan is the plan that most people that are at the lake are familiar with. It tells us how we're going to install boat docks, seawalls, breakwaters, lake water pumps, those types of everyday uses that adjoining landowners seek, wish, and desire. And the historic property plan, there are a number of historic properties at the lake. Bagnell Dam itself is on the National Registry. I mentioned the Camp Hospital earlier, it's on the National Registry. Wilmore Lodge is on the registry. And we have an old iron smelter from the middle 1850s in Bollinger Creek that's also on the National Registry. So when activity occurs at any of those structures or around them, we have a number of requirements that we have to meet and obligations that we have to make sure are, are taken care of. And we do that as outlined in our historic property plan. When we did the mass inlay of concrete and the refurbishment of the dam that I showed you the pictures of earlier. We had to consult with the State Historic Preservation Office because we were changing the physical character of the dam and how it looked. So we are preparing a model of what it was before our work started that will be displayed in the museum at Wilmore Lodge. And really most of that consultation on these historic structures is if you're going to change it, you need to document what it was and why the need was to change it, to make sure that you preserve the historic character before you begin the project. And then the other plan that we have that we administer out of the shoreline management office is the recreation plan. And that's basically just a, an overview of what the recreation opportunities are at the Lake of the Ozarks, how many people are accessing the boat ramps, how many watercraft are on the lake? Is there enough opportunity for people to get out and enjoy the reservoir? And um, With the heavy development at our lake, I think we're meeting those obligations and, and it's pretty hard to say otherwise. We are probably the heaviest use reservoir in the United States. Um, so those are, the, those are the key areas that the Shoreline Management Office concentrates on. Uh, the guys at Bagnell Dam proper, they handle all of the things that are associated with dam safety, electric generation, and, the, and those kind of items. So as far as lake management goes, um, 
our permitting program is obviously our, our biggest um, activity. Everything that's built along the lake, along the shoreline itself, requires a permit and authorization from Ameren before it's installed. We issue about 4,000 permits a year out of our office. Half of those are transferring from a previous owner to a new owner and the other are our new requests. Um, most frequently, our, our most frequent request is modifying someone's dock. So anytime you have a boat dock at the lake and you have a permit for it, that permit's good as long as you own the structure up until you decide to change the size of the structure, at which time you'd have to modify your permit. And that's the lion's share of what our office takes care of is making sure those dock permit requests, seawall requests or bank stabilization requests comply with our, our federal license and our shoreline management plan and that we issue the proper authorization before that work begins. We have two main tools to um, access and to ensure that we're meeting our obligations in our permitting program. We have a, a geographic information system and our permit management system. Those two items are interconnected and it allows us to handle a lot of information and see it graphically so we can make determinations and ensure that we're meeting our obligations as much as possible. We have a staff of nine. You think of nine people issuing 4,000 permits in a year. It's a pretty large workload, so we need to be as efficient as, efficient as we can. And the, the geographic information system is really the heart and soul of that. Here's a kind of an example shot of that. There's a lot of information you can see on this screen. All of the red squares that represent the permitted size of a boat dock and their permit numbers are displayed. The pink lines or the purple lines are the seawalls that have been installed. We can tell there's a boat dock in the lower left corner, two of them without any permit numbers. Those are potentially boat docks that have been installed without authorization. So what our office does every year is basically we start at Bagnell Dam and we drive to Truman Dam and we drive back. It takes us about 70 days to accomplish that. But we have the GIS up on a laptop in our boat with a, a Garmin GPS receiver. We can tell exactly where our location is and we can see what's on the shoreline in relationship to our GIS to take a look and see, hey, is this a new facility installed? Is it not? Do we need to look to see if we've had a change here where we need to issue a permit? It's a pretty intensive uh, survey of the lake shoreline. It lets us find when things have occurred and whether they've been properly authorized or not. And we follow up on that. You can see on the right hand side of the screen, we can pull up um, the, the owner's information and what his permits are. That's tied back to our permit management system, but we display it graphically here on our GIS. And so makes it pretty efficient to deal with a lot of information in a quick amount of time. We have about a million permitting documents in our office. So we have a lot of data that we have to keep and collect. And without the integration of the shoreline management GIS and permit system, it would be pretty unwieldy to do that if we were still digging out paper files out of a filing cabinet somewhere. This is just a quick shot of just the permit system itself. It just, it, would be all of the background data that populated the GIS that I just showed you. So those two are just interconnected. It's just a fast way to display a lot of data and manage a lot of information at one time. I mentioned lake levels. We do operation, um, operate the lake under a guide curve. Our top elevation that we wanna be at is uh, 660 feet. Um, if you look at this curve, that's represented by the, the blue line. The black line is where we try to operate the lake. That's our preferred level that if, if we can. And then the brownish orange line is the lower level that we can go to. So each year we do an annual drawdown of the lake. Starting in January, we drop about six feet of water out of the reservoir. We'll take that down to elevation 654, about middle of February. We do that 
really one purpose only, and that is to make room for spring rains. When we discussed the watershed a few slides back, I mentioned that there are a lot of players in how the lake level operates. You have the lake residents that want it to be perfectly flat and level and never an adjustment. You want the farmers downstream in the Osage River Valley that need to make their livelihood farming the floodplain. They would like for us to keep the reservoir low so we can store a lot of rain and, and protect uh, their interest by preventing flooding. Our capability to hold back a flood is relatively small. However, Truman Reservoir is rather large and was designed for flood control. And you have people that live above Truman that farm as well. So they would like to see Truman kept at lower levels so their crops aren't impacted. So really, as, as I mentioned earlier, lake level and lake level management is part of a much larger program and operation. And there are many other people other than lake residents that have a wish and a say in how the lake is operated. So that's kind of why the guide curve was developed to let everyone know if, if at all possible, we want to keep the lake level somewhere right around that black line and how it corresponds in and out of the seasons. We are very fortunate with our lake levels. Even though we may have a six foot fluctuation, we have one of the most stable lake levels in the United States. Um, was it, but two years ago, I believe Truman Lake was, you know, 30 feet plus above their floodplain or, or above their normal operation. So there are many reservoirs in the US that, that have a much larger swing in their elevations than we do here at the lake. Talk quickly about some environmental initiatives that we handle out of the shoreline management office. Obviously the adopt a shoreline program. We banned all white styrofoam. We're part of the E. coli testing program. that was a big thing a few years back. Um, we work with the Lake of the Ozarks Watershed Alliance for promoting low impact landscaping. We installed a fish barrier net as part of relicensing. Um, the conservation commission was very concerned about the amount of paddlefish that could be killed if they are sucked through the turbines during heavy generation and that actually occurred uh, more than once. So during relicensing, it was requested that we figure out a way to keep uh, fish from going through the turbines. Um, so we installed a net in front of the lake. When you drive across the dam, if you look at the big giant orange buoys, those are the buoys to the anchors. And then if you see the little smaller yellow buoys, that is the net itself. So basically there is a net that goes from the bottom of the lake all the way to the top of the lake that prevents fish from getting through it and into the turbine intakes to, uh, to prevent that fish mortality down in the, the river should we start generating heavily. One of the things that fish like is the, the especially the paddlefish is the flowing water so as we're moving water through the dam, it sets up a little bit of a current and they can get behind the powerhouse or they could. And then if we really start generating, we may take those through the intakes. And basically if you've ever uh, saw a blender in action, that's basically what it looks like when a fish goes through the turbine. It's not, not too pretty on the downstream side. So with the installation of the net, we've completely eliminated that problem. I mentioned the, uh, Minimum daily or the turbine replacements and the dissolved oxygen that's necessary down in the river. We also increased our minimum daily flow from Bagnell Dam. We're actually putting more water out of the dam during low flow times than we were before our most current license was issued. We increased that. That should help with the aquatic life downstream of the, the project. Um, then we had some park and development enhancements that we provided money to the state park to ensure that they were meeting their needs. And then we also have some ongoing erosion monitoring of the Osage River Valley itself to try to change our flow schedule when we have to generate electricity or have large flows to help limit erosion downstream in the Osage Valley. I briefly mentioned Adopt a Shoreline, but this is really one of Ameren, Missouri's largest environmental initiatives at the lake. This is where you as a lake resident can adopt a section of shoreline, organize your volunteers and go out and clean it up at least once a year. 
It's been a very su successful program. Um, over five and a half million pounds of debris has been removed from the lake. That's an enormous amount of trash. Um, our lake would look much different today if we had not started this program almost 30 years ago. In 2021, we will be celebrating our 30th year. So we're looking forward to that milestone, obviously. And, and really, it, the program changed the whole complexion of the lake. Before this was started, the lake had an enormous amount of trash. And then until the white styrofoam was banned, it always had a source of trash. Today, we're just removing those stray encapsulated floats that might break apart, and then the recreational trash and debris that'll accumulate in a reservoir where you have two or three million visitors in a year. Man certainly has an impact anywhere he goes, and the more you congregate him, and the tighter he is into a space, the larger that impact is. So with millions of visitors each year, we have to be a good steward, to make sure we get that land and area cleaned up and picked up. And that's been possible thanks to the over 14,000 volunteers that have participated in the Adopter Shoreline program since we began in 1991. And you always wonder what can one person, what, what difference can just a person make? We have so many people that one family has adopted five miles of shoreline and they go out and clean it up every year. Um, that's, that's what can happen with just one person making the difference. It's a, it's a great testament to just what a little bit of stewardship and a little bit of initiative will make. And I know the master naturalists actually have a section of shoreline adopted up by Haha Tonka. So if you're interested in participating in the Adopt Shoreline program, we would always love to talk to you about that. And with that, I think that'll close out my presentation. Hope you've enjoyed and good luck with uh, your continued studies to become a Missouri Master Naturalist. Thank you to Brian Vance for this uh, very educational uh, opportunity of, of, of the, the beginning and the middle and, and where we're at today with Bagnell Dam. Thanks again, uh, Brian. And Folks, if uh, you're listening and you have questions, be sure to post them and we'll see what we can do about getting those questions answered. I know you don't have any questions.